Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, 3rd Canto, 11th chapter. And today we're going to cover texts 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10, 11, and 12 don't have a purport, so I'm just going to chant the Sanskrit and read the translation for those three, and then we'll do 13 together, and I'll read the translation and purport for that and speak on that one primarily. No, that's, that's 10. That's 10. So actually, if you want to go ahead and put 13 on the board, because, yeah, yeah. Sean Marari, Prabhu, could you put 13 on there? Because otherwise, despite the fact that I just said what I'm going to do, everybody will try to chant along with me. That's what always happens. So I just put 13 up there, and this way nobody can chant with me even if they because they won't remember. Okay. Yamas chatvaras chatvaro marchanam ahani ube pakshapancha dashahani sukla krishnas chamanada. Translation. It is calculated that there are four parahars, which are also called yamas in the day and four in the night of the, of the human being. Similarly, 15 days and nights are a fortnight, and there are two fortnights, white and black, in a month. Tayo samu chayo masha pitrinam tadaharnisham tvotav rito sat ayanam takshinam chotaram divi. Translation, the aggregate of two fortnights is one month, and that period is one complete day and night for the pizza planets. Two of such months comprise one season, and six months comprise one complete movement of the sun from south to north. Ayane chahani prayur batsado dvadasav smritaha sambatsada satam nirnam paramayur nirupitam. Two solar movements make one day and night of the demigods. And that combination of day and night is one complete calendar year for the human being. The human being has a duration of life of 100 years. And now 13. Graharksha Tara Chakrashta. Graharksha Tara Chakrashta. Paraman Vadina Jagat Paraman Vadina Jagat Sambatsara Vasanena Sambatsara Vasanena Paryat Yani Miso Vibhu Paryat yani miso vibhu. Graharksha tara chakrashta. Paraman vadina jigat. Sambatsara vasanena. Paryat yani miso vibhu.
Vaishnavis. Graha, influential planets like the moon. <clears throat> Riksha, luminaries like Ashvini. Tara, stars. Chakrashtaha, in the orbit. Parama Anu Adina, along with the atoms. Jagat, the entire universe. Samvatsara avasenena. By the end of one year. Paryeta completes its orbit. Animisaha, the, the eternal time. Vibhu, the Almighty. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. The influential stars, planets, luminaries, and atoms all over the universe are rotating in their respective orbits under the direction of the Supreme, represented by eternal Kala. Purport. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated that the sun is the eye of the Supreme and it rotates in its particular orbit of time. Okay. Similarly, beginning from the sun down to the atom, all bodies are under the influence of Kala Chakra, or the orbit of eternal time. And each of them has a scheduled orbital time of one Sambatsara. Omagana Timadam Dasha Jananjana Shalakaya Chakshudan Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Upadamayam Dirati Swapadanti Kam. So the first uh, significant point here is it's this translation and purport are referring to an orbit of time. We're generally used to thinking of an orbit in space, you know, like the planets are orbiting, the earth orbits around the sun, and the moon orbits around the earth. So it's an orbit through space. But this particular, uh, it's an, a, an, uh, a different concept is being introduced here. There's an orbit of time, okay? So it's saying here that uh, the sun is the eye, and it, the sun rotates in a particular orbit of time, as do all the bodies. Uh, uh, all bodies are under the influence of the Kala Chakra or the orbit of eternal time. So that's the first point. Now, this uh, it can get kind of technical, and I could see what I can understand. I was having some understanding of what Naikatma said a few days ago when he gave class. That he said, "My, I can't remember his exact words, but he said, my heart goes out to the devotees who, in you know, coming classes who have to give these classes because it's kind of difficult." subject matter to explain, get you, you know, to understand. And Archita yesterday in the class made it some interesting comment there too. And I could under understand that I was preparing for the class and I was trying to understand about the Sambhatsara and the Kala Chakra, but I think I have some minute understanding about it. But um, referring to what Ar Archita said during his class yesterday that he said, you know, we shouldn't get hung up on the details you know, focusing on the detail, it's, uh, but can't focus on purification. That, you know, we're hearing the Bhagavatam, we're, the, the, the real important thing is purification, not to get, you know, nitpick about, you might understand the details, we might not. But, and he quoted a verse from the Bhagavatam, Archita, um, about how hearing the Bhagavatam is purifying, and I'll quote another verse, different verse, Yashyam Bhai Shuyamanana Krishna Padama Purushe Bhaktir Utpajate Pumsam 
Shoka Moha Bayapaha. And it's explained in the uh, first canto, seventh chapter, text seven, that simply by giving all reception to the Vedic literatures, the uh, feeling for loving devotional service to Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, awakens or sprouts from within the heart. And that destroys soka, moha, baya. It destroys uh, lamentation, illusion, and fearfulness. So he knows even if you don't understand the word of what you just heard in these translations, it's okay. Just being here, hearing the Bhagavatam, uh, the Vedic literature, we're getting this purification of consciousness, and the benefit will be that we become free, ultimately become free from fearfulness, illusion, and uh, lamentation. So there's benefit. But hopefully I'll say something that's understandable. Okay, so uh, in the purport here, Prabhupada says, um, beginning from the sun down to the atom, all bodies are under the influence of the Kala Chakra, or the orbit of eternal time, and each of them has a scheduled orbital time of one Sambhatsara. So, I think the principle here that's being uh, explicated or stated by Prabhupada is that all the bodies, sun, atom, whatever, you name it, all bodies un are under the influence of the Kala Chakra. That's the basic principle that's being enunciated here. And a detail, technical detail, is that each of them has a scheduled orbital time of one samvatsara. And I'm, so I'm going to speak about a little something about the detail, uh, but I'm not going to, sorry, about the principle, the basic principle, that all bodies are under the influence of the Kala Chakra. I'll, I'll try to explain what that Kala Chakra is and say something about that. And I'm really not going to say much, if anything, about the detail, which is that each of the bodies has a scheduled orbital time of one samvatsara, because that's kind of gets pretty technical and complicated, at least for me. Okay, so on the point of that, all bodies are under the influence of the Kala Chakra. What is the Kala Chakra? <clears throat> I found a, a good definition for that. In, in the database, it says, the Sanskrit word Kala Chakra denotes time's control of the cyclical movement of the physical world. Kala is a name for the Supreme Person and his feature is time, and chakra means wheel, the wheel of time. Okay. Each and every physical thing, from the smallest atomic particle up to the complete form of the universe, has a particular wheel of time that it is obliged to follow. So just like a planet has a particular path, it's you know, it's obliged to follow an orbit. So in the same way, there's like an orbit of time, okay? Kala chakra therefore refers not only to, one's, to, one, to an object's movements, but to its overall duration. See, so it's referring to its, its uh, position, not just in space, but in time as well. Uh, in other words, it's life expectancy. The earth, sun, moon, stars, planets, our, uh, our, our physical bodies, and so on, disappear in the course of time, and their particular durations are called Kala Chakras. So that was from the Veda base, and that's some sort of a definition of what a Kala Chakra is, okay? Now elsewhere, in his, uh, in a Bhagavatam, I don't know if this was a lecture, I can't remember where I got this quote from, but Prabhupada said about this, the Kala Chakra said, uh, he quotes from the Brahma Samhita, Brahma, Brahmati Samhita Kala Chakra. He says, the sun moves within the Kala Chakra. Okay, this wheel of time, the orbit of time. He refers to it as the orbit of time. The sun is under the control of time. And time is controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that's another very basic point that the sun as every physical body is under the control of time, but time is under the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And, um, and that's significant. I don't know if you remember, but back a few days ago when um, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Maharaj gave class 
At the end of the class, I asked a question about something he said, because he said in the class that there's no time is conspicuous by its absence in the spiritual world. And I, at the end of the class, I said, I raised the question, but he also quoted from the Brahma Samhita. I can't remember the Sanskrit, but the, the verse, the translation was that every, in the spiritual world, every word is a song and every step or gate is a dance. So in my question, I said, Maharaj, you know, a song doesn't happen at one moment. A dance doesn't happen in one moment. There's a progression. There's a, it's, you know, these things happen sequentially. So, and, they and that was a verse describing the spiritual world. It was a, a verse describing Goloka Vrindavan. So I'm, how can you say, how, can, how, is, how, how do we understand that in the spiritual world, there's no time? Because obviously things have to happen sequentially. And he said, one aspect of his answer was that I remember was that it's time is experienced differently. That it can, can be elongated. Anyway, he, he made that. That's one comment. I. That's the thing that he said that stuck with me. Okay. So this is and, I, and he asked me, if, do you want to say something? He asked me if, and I said, well, in the Bhagavad Gita it says that time is wears things down. It has like a destructive influence. I wasn't prepared to really say anything. I just was asking that question. Anyway, after the class, I was reflecting upon the whole thing, and I feel like I got some additional insight into that, and it's relevant to today's class as well, is that um, time, we are subservient to time in the material world. We're subservient to time, but time is subservient to Krishna, and that's what we just heard here. You know, the sun Everything is under the control of time, but time is under the control of Krishna. So for us, yeah, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, time acts to wear things down. Time acts to destroy things, to uh, ultimately annihilate things altogether, but not so in the spiritual world. See, so in that sense, there's no, uh, ma there's no material time in the spiritual world. You know, things happen sequentially, but there's no sense of wearing down, destroying, annihilating like that. Time doesn't have that kind of an influence there. Rather, because uh, as we said, time is under the control of Krishna. Time acts rather than to spoil things. You know, here it spoils our experience. We don't want to get old. We're forced to get old. We don't want to die. We're forced to die. Okay? It spoils our experience. But in the spiritual world, time, because it's under Krishna's control, it's, it's actually identical with Krishna. It's, that's stated. It enhances the experience. And he kind of gave a good example. He, he touched upon it briefly when he was giving the class about the rasa dance. When Krishna was having the rasa dance with the gopis, um, it was, you know, the gopis snuck away and it was supposed to happen for a, a, an evening. And they, then they go back. But they were all having such a good time that, uh, you know, that wasn't long enough. So Krishna expanded. He, he, as he said, he used the word elongated, and that's a good word. He, he elongated that night to be a night of Lord Brahma. So that night was elongated into 4,300,000,000 years, as opposed to 4.3 hours. It became 4,300,000,000 years. See, so that's an example of how Krishna uh, uses time. It's, it's his servant or part of him. It's, he, he used it to enhance the experience. Whereas for us, it has the effect of spoiling an experience. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, why is it like that for us? Why is it that for us, time is the spoiler? Well, there's a reason for that. And I found the purport where Prabhupada talked about that, but I can't locate it at the moment. But the, the gist of what Prabhupada had to say about that was that um, we're not supposed to be, we're, we're, see, we're essentially spiritual beings, we're souls in, in a material body. And we're very much at this point, generally speaking, the conditioned souls are taking shelter of the material world and their the, the material body, the material world, the whole like material conception of life 
we're not supposed to be doing that. So time is set up in such a way as to kind of like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an educator. It can be. It can serve in, as that. You know, it's, it's, it's spoiling experiences. You're forced to get old. You're forced to get sick. You're forced to die. All sorts of things. Undesirable things you know, are coming our way because of time. And it's, it's a message. Don't take shelter here. You know, don't take shelter of this, you know, this temporary, illusory material world. Right? That's the message. Um, that's, you know, that, that time is giving here in the material world. Now, yeah, but the thing is this now. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's kind of easy to understand how time is, time is a problem for us, but time's not a problem for Krishna. Just like um, the example Prabhupada uses often about the prison system. So, you know, there's a king, and, and, and is in his kingdom, along right in the beginning with the educational system, the medical system, and, you know, the, the government's judicial system, they have a prison system. Okay? So the prison system is not a problem for the king, and it's not a problem for the law-abiding citizens. Actually, it's a pleasure for them because it's employment, and, you know, say it's, it's a prison system, okay, it's more jobs for the law-abiding citizen, and also they can feel rest assured that they're going to, you know, things are going to be safer out on the streets because there's a prison system that, you know, to deal with the criminals. So who is the, the prison system a problem for? It's a problem for the criminals. See, it's not a problem for the law-abiding citizens and certainly not a problem for the king. So in the same way, time is not a problem for Krishna. Time is not a problem for any of the niche siddha eternally liberated souls in the spiritual world either which is the vast majority of souls. I've heard Prabhupada, you know, give figures from anywhere from 10%, less than 10% to like way bigger figures. And it's, it's just a teeny fraction of all the souls that uh, exist or here in the material world. So for the vast majority of beings, you know, people, you could say, don't have a problem with time because it's just like the prison system. You know, the vast majority of Americans don't have any problem with the prison system. It's the criminals who have a problem with the prison system. Okay? So another point is, um, as, I get, as I mentioned, that it's, it's there, the prison system's there for a reason, though. It, not just to punish, it, it, although it does serve that uh, capacity, it's to educate. It's, 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 the government sets up a, you know, a prison system in hopes that as a result of undergoing what's the experience of a prison system, these people who have the criminal, the citizens, because even criminals are citizens, okay? So these citizens with the criminal mentality, they will be reformed. You know, they will be reformed as a result of that this experience. And when they come out of the prison system, they'll be law-abiding, good citizens. So in the same way, you know, Krishna's got this material world set up in such a way that uh, it's punishment, sure, you know, we suffer in different ways here, but it's with, with the hopes that as a result of undergoing this experience, we'll be reformed and we will be able to go back to, you know, our spiritual life and uh, serving Krishna. So that's the, that's the hope, you know, that, that's the, the plan behind the material energy. Um, but as we can see, Mostly conditioned souls are pretty slow learners, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> here we are, we, we have this, this, you know, the material world's here and, and the Krishna consciousness movement is here for the last 50 plus years now. And we could see that, uh, you know, people aren't banging down the doors to become devotees. You, you, we don't have like a big long line like you do for In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> you know, to, to come to the morning program or some other place. So, you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but um, that's the reality that, you know, people are, conditioned souls are pretty slow learners. Um, that's okay as far as Krishna's concerned because, you know, Krishna's got all the time, literally and figuratively, all the time in the world. You know, um, Prabhupada states in, in the Bhagavad Gita that, you know, we've been in this material world for millions and millions of births. Elsewhere, I've heard him say, crores and crores, a crore is 10 million. 
And in one lecture he gave on the Chaitanya Charitamrita, 1967, he said, many, many Brahma's lives have passed and still we are conditioned. And Brahma's life is 311 trillion, 40 billion years. So as Krishna's got time. If conditioned souls want to be stubborn, okay, do your thing. <laughs> it's no skin off Krishna's back, so to speak. He can, he can handle it, you know, but we'll just be here a really long time, which in, according to those, we have been here a really long time. So where do we come into the picture here? I mean, uh, how can we, because we're on the, you know, we're on the way out, hopefully. I mean, we are on the way out. Hopefully we'll stay on the way out. We'll stay on the boat, so to speak. Um, and, and the way we can be of help to all the other conditioned souls out there, this is a, sort of, I'm going to present an, uh, uh, my understanding of how the Krishna consciousness movement can expand and how uh, we're it's sort of like a spiritual dynamic behind preaching, okay? And it's this, that, as I said, we could see the conditioned souls are really slow learners, you know, they're out there just absorbed in their material activities, despite the fact that the Krishna conscious movement has been here on the earth planet for over 50 years. They're still doing a real good job of just ignoring it and being a, totally absorbed in material activities, despite the fact that we're doing different things, okay? But here's how, here's how uh, we, we've come into the picture. Here's my understanding. So there's a verse in the Bhagavatam. Um, well, uh, before I quote the verse, I'll just uh, I'll ask it in the form of a question. Say you want to um, benefit your entire body. You know, you're feeling kind of weak and uh, tired, and you want to you, you need some energy. What's one thing you could do? Okay, but yeah, present it as, that's a detail, but present it as a more philosophical principle. What do you do when you need to energize your body? You su Yeah, you supply food to the stomach via the mouth, right? There's nine holes in the body, but there's one hole that's designed to, you know, feed the body. So if you're feeling really weak and tired, you take some good food, it has to be, you know, some nutritious, proper food, and you supply it to the mouth, and then it gets, you know, goes to the stomach, and then the whole body gets energy, right? Okay. What if you want to benefit like a plant or a tree? Let's take a Tulsi plant. You want to benefit a Tulsi plant. You can see it's really hot. And see. What do you do? But where do you pour the water? Right, if you, just like if you feed the, supply the food to the stomach, the whole body gets energy. When you supply water to the roots, the whole plant or tree gets the benefit. If you try to do it any other way, not only does, it doesn't work. It's not like, well, that, that could work too. No, it's not like there's no alternative method. There's only that one method, you see? So, in the same way, when, you, when we serve Krishna favorably, Krishna is the root cause of, the, of all existence. And when we serve Krishna favorably, all living entities get the benefit. So here's the verse. It's from the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yata taro mula nasechanena tripyanti tat skanda bhujo prashakaha prano paharach cha yatendriyanam tataiva sarvarhanam achuteja as pouring water on the root of a tree energizes the trunk, branches, twigs, and everything else, and it's the only way you can. There's no other way to do it. If you if you try to pour the water on the on the trunk, I'm sorry, on the yeah, on the trunk, on the branches, on the twigs, it won't do any good. And as supplying food to the stomach enlivens the senses and the limbs of the body, same way. There's no other way to do it. Don't try to feed the. Uh, this, as I said, there's nine holes. If you try to feed your ears or your nose or any other you know, opening in your body, it won't work, okay? So it says here, simply by worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead through devotional service automatically satisfies the demigods and all, all living entities who are parts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, okay? So it's an analogy, you know, just like the, the body is energized by supplying food to the stomach, the plant or the tree is benefited by supplying the water to the roots. All living entities benefit when, we, when Krishna is served 
is served favorably. So we really, this is my understanding, that we really do come into the picture because by engaging favorably in devotional service, um, Krishna is pleased and all living entities, you know, uh, uh, will get the benefit. Uh, it's not, well, it's not my speculation. In the fourth canto, and I can't remember the, the text and the purport, but Prabhupada says, the pure devotees are always interested in delivering the uh, conditioned souls. And, uh, and, and, and Prabhupada goes on to say, so Krishna being pleased by that attitude, he enlightens the general populace from within by his causeless mercy. I think that's kind of like an you know, explaining that. And just, when the pure devotees are engaged in devotional service, uh, it's referring maybe to preaching, but everything we're doing is preaching. The Krishna conscious movement is a preaching movement. So when we're enthusiastically participating in the Krishna consciousness movement, even just by you know, coming to the program, chanting your rounds, coming to the Bhagavatam class, everything you do, everything we're doing, that's the Krishna conscious movement is preaching because it's a preaching movement. It's just like everything you do to help the army is fighting the war. You know, the army needs somebody to make weapons. The army needs somebody to cook the food. The army, need, you know, et cetera. You see, so everything you do that contributes to the effort of the army is you're, you're, you're helping to fight, to win the war, so to speak. So in the same way, you know, devotees are doing deity worship. The devotees are doing the restaurant. The, it's all part of the Krishna, helping the Krishna conscious movement, and that's it's the preaching. So getting back to the point there, that if we please Krishna, you know, if we're interested in, you know, if, uh, enthusiastically participating in the Krishna consciousness movement, that's pleasing to, to, the, you know, to Prabhupada, to the predecessor Acharyas and everything. And then they reciprocate by enlightening the general populace from within by their causeless mercy. It's, you know, it's not like necessarily a one-to-one -one thing. Oh, I went out and I met these people and I gave out these books. And now those people who got those books will become devotees. Maybe. It, could, it can happen like that. It can happen like that. But the, but the overall my, uh, principle, that at least according to my understanding, is that by enthusiastically engaging in uh, devotional service, participating in Lord Chaitanya's Sankatan movement, the predecessor of Charis, Lord Chaitanya will be pleased and then they will enlighten people from within by their causeless mercy to come forward and take part in this movement. And I think and Prabhupada himself, and I've mentioned this before in previous classes, but I think Prabhupada saw the, 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 um, the coming of the Krishna, the, you know, the, the birth of the Krishna conscious movement in that light. He, in a letter he wrote to Sudama, I can't remember, the 72, he said, when I was alone in your New York, I was thinking, who will listen to me in this horrible, sinful place? But at least I can distribute a few of my books. That is something. So this Prabhupada was determined. He had an instruction from his spiritual master, and he was determined to execute it. And he was so determined and so sincere to execute that instruction uh, that, that was just, it was pleasing. It was pleasing to his spiritual master, the Prampara, the civil succession, was pleasing to Lord Chaitanya. And then, I'm getting, getting back to the letter now, he said, so I was thinking, who will listen to this horrible, sinful place? At least I could distribute a few of my books out of something. But then, but Krishna was all along planning something I could not see. He said, he brought, the, he brought, he sent you young boys and girls one by one for uh, helping me to execute the mission of Lord Chaitanya. Now I could see it's a miracle. See? So Prabhupada thought of it as a miracle. And what, did Prabhupada do the miracle? Did, did Prabhupada actually perform the miracle himself? No. Prabhupada, but Prabhupada behaved in such a way that he got Krishna to do a miracle. That's how he saw it. Now I could see it as a miracle. He said, otherwise, one old man in your city of New York with just barely enough money for buying his food, how could he even survive? What to speak of spreading a God conscious movement to save the whole world. That's how Prabhupada was seeing it. You know, I don't think he was just, you know, being facetious or that was how he, he wrote in that letter. See? So Prabhupada was so sincere, so determined to carry out the instruction of his spiritual master, which is, you know, coming right down, that he like forced Krishna's hand. Krishna said, Okay, well these people aren't qualified. There's no reason why 
these kind of people should get an opportunity to engage in devotional service. But here's my pure devotee. He's so sincere about performing, executing the instruction of his spiritual master. Um, I got to, I got to do something. I can't see him disappointed. So yeah, I think Lord Chaitanya had to reciprocate. He forced Krishna's hand, and he had to reciprocate. And that's the Krishna conscious movement. And and and, and just like Prabhupada said in that purport. Krishna, when Krishna sees that attitude in a, in a devotee, he enlightens the general populace from within by his causeless mercy. And that's exactly what Lord Chaitanya did in, 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 you know, in, the set, in the starting of the Krishna conscious movement. He just picked certain souls and said, okay, you're enlightened within now. Go forward and you know, take, show some interest in this, my pure devotee here. And People came forward and they took an interest and started practicing Krishna consciousness. So, as I said, that's, we, we figure into the whole thing. It's not like what we're doing doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. It makes a big difference. If we're really sincere and enthusiastic to just do the basic program that Prabhupada's given us, which is, you know, this it's, you know, sadhana, the temple program in the morning, and then going about whatever our service is, enthusiastically, sincerely, then Krishna's watching. He's going to, he's pleased by that and he will reciprocate. He'll reciprocate by sending people to, uh, to participate in the Krishna conscious movement. And I have a reference from the Chaitanya Charitamrita Reader where Prabhupada kind of says as much. He says here, this is from the Majulila chapter four, text 79. He says, the Krishna consciousness movement has spread all over the world within a very short time. And mundane people are very astonished at this. However, by the grace of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we understand that everything is possible by the grace of Krishna. Why does Krishna have to take five years? In five days, he can spread his name and fame all over the world like wildfire. Those who have faith and devotion to Krishna can understand that these things happen so wonderfully by the grace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We are simply the instruments. So we have to be the instruments, you know? And, and, and he goes on to say, in the fierce battle of Kurukshetra, Arjuna was victorious within 18 days simply because Krishna's grace was on his side. Okay, now here Prabhupada generalizes and gives us the, makes it, an, you know, the instruction for us. He says, if preachers in our Krishna conscious movement are sincere devotees of Krishna, Krishna will always be with them because he is very kind and favorable to all his devotees. Just as Arjuna and Krishna were victorious in the battle of Kurukshetra, this Krishna consciousness movement will surely emerge victorious if we but remain sincere devotees of the Lord and serve the Lord according to the advice of the predecessors. In parentheses it says, the six Goswamis and other devotees of the Lord. Then it goes, within the society, we must try to serve the predecessors by preaching Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's cult and spreading his name and fame all over the world. If we attempt this seriously within the society, it will be successfully done. There is no question of estimating how this will happen in the mundane sense, but without a doubt, it happens by Krishna's grace. See? So I think that's kind of saying what I, supporting the point I was making, that it's not our, exactly our activities, which is spreading the Krishna conscious movement, and you know, like our, how many books we distribute, or, how many plates of prasadam we distribute, or, or uh, how many harinams we go on. No, what, what's really the essence of the whole thing is that by performing these activities, we're pleasing. We're, you know, this is what Prabhupada, you know, the Prabhupada and the, uh, the Acharyas have told us to do. We're pleasing the you know, pra uh, Prampara and the predecessor Acharyas. And when they're pleased, they reciprocate. And that reciprocation takes the form of people coming forward to become devotees. So. That's, that's my understanding of how it works. So I'll stop there. Does anybody have any? Uh, Daniel, wow. You had a question before I even asked, get out of my mouth. Okay, go ahead. The trouble to, to, give, a, to give a class to a really like, difficult subject about the Kala Chakra, and you uh, kind of wore it down uh, in an understandable way for us. And um, I got many questions, but <laughs> okay. but just but I have like a I have a question. Give me your best one, okay? Okay, and but before that, with connection to what you just said, okay. I was reading in the first canto, chapter fourteen, 
which is Deuterestra Quis Om, um, text 9 of the Shemad Bhagavatam. And in the purport of Prabhupada, he says, Personal labor must be there in addition to the Lord's benediction. But without the Lord's benediction, no one is successful simply by personal labor. Spot on. That's spot on. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. And, and then, uh, I, I didn't quote the whole thing, it's like, but it's on the same purport. If one could achieve success without the sanction of the Lord, then no medical practitioner would fail to cure a patient. Exem an example giving in the purport. Uh, that just means the same example giving. Therefore, the conclusion is that God's sanction is the immediate cause for all happenings, good or bad. The successful man should feel grateful to the Lord for all he has achieved. Yeah, thank you. That's good. And um, my question was about the, the yugas. Is the yugas, as I understood, they kind of really only work uh, on the middle planetary system? Because higher planetary system, they don't see the difference. Lower, same thing. Is it that every planet feels at the same time Kali Yuga? How does it work? I can clarify my question. No, your question is clear. I'm just uh, trying to remember my Yuga knowledge. Um, okay, so there's no Kali Yuga in the heavenly planets, huh? You're saying there's no heavy, there's no Kali Yuga. They don't experience the Yugas in the heavenly planets. Yeah. And they don't ex experience any of the, the Yugas in the lower planetary systems? Did you just recently read that? No, but from my understanding, because the time is so long that they don't see the difference either. Say that again? They don't see the difference that the, it's because in, in the lower planetary system, they, they live, they suffer so long that they, they don't see the difference. Oh, okay. So. So planets, when you say the middle planetary system, where we all, yeah, we're experiencing this, the yugas in the same way because it's all controlled by Lord Brahma's day. So at the end of the 4.3 billion years, it's gonna, you know, there'll be a, a partial dissolution for, for all the planets that are affected, you know, by that system, so to speak. It's not like everybody's got their own kind of time scale. So simple answer to that question. I mean, you know, it's all under. You know, Lord Brahma's in the Bhagavad Gita. You know, during Brahma's day, things are manifest, and at the time of Brahma's night, everything is inundated, and you know, this goes into dissolution again. And then Brahma's day comes again and comes back out again. So all the planets that are within that system, they will experience the yugas in the same in the same way. That's my off the top of my head answer. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. The ones who aren't part of the Vasalila, they just experience time ordinarily. Time is an experience, you see? So Krishna controls experience. So, so that, you know, the people, the devotees who are participating in the Vasalila with Krishna, they experienced that, uh, they, a really long time. They were dancing with Krishna. They, it's actually, they're you know, fully satisfied. But their husbands, husbands didn't experience that.